It's a pleasure to be here and get to talk about this interesting topic to this group. Very exciting. So when I think about screening and prevention in the context of cancer, I like to think about it in terms of our opportunities to reduce cancer death. And so this is a somewhat simplistic schema, but it gives you a sense of the timeline of how we see cancer developing and also of the successes we've had in terms of our therapies. And so you can see that when we see a progression of cancer, we have initially normal tissue up at the top there, uh, followed by uh, a transition onto malignant tissue in the second block. Uh, and then unfortunately, in some cases, to distant cancer spread. This is an example of a patient who has a bone scan that unfortunately shows spread of breast cancer to the bones for metastasis. And then unfortunately, we usually aren't in a position to cure disease that spread distantly, and thus we will see people progress on to an early death. In terms of the history of intervening in this process, early efforts as the field of oncology was getting started really concentrated on disease that had presented clinically, often when it had spread throughout the body. And so we were talking about treating distant disease and usually palliating, trying to treat symptoms, but not getting very far in terms of cure. The history of the last several decades has been one of moving back in the process toward the left on this figure to earlier detection and earlier treatment before cancer may be visible on a clinical exam or palpable, but getting in there earlier and thus improving outcomes. But ultimately, we'd like to take a step even further back in the pathway to target prevention, which of course would be better than cure and prevent a lot of morbidity and mortality. But so in order to shift this focus to early detection and prevention, we have to have a way to personalize our interventions and have a sense of who really needs what in terms of managing cancer risk. And so I think our route forward is through personalized medicine and specifically genetic testing for cancer risk. So I'm going to start with some basics about the genetics of cancer. So cancer is, by definition, a genetic disease of which the underlying defect is genomic instability, basically meaning that cancers have a lot of different mutations and they accumulate more in general as they progress and grow. We know a number of the culprit genes which are often mutated commonly in cancers, and those are often genes that control proliferation or cell growth, apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, telling cells to die when it's their time and not grow on and continue dividing forever. And then also genes that control DNA repair. We think of them as spell check genes that make sure that errors are not propagated, which is one of the paths to cancer. Now, the inherited cancer syndromes that I'll touch on today are often due to inherited mutations in genes that are important to maintain stability in the genome. And these are syndromes that are associated with the highest cancer risks in a population. So for some very basic figures here, this is a human karyotype showing chromosomes, and normal cells have two gene copies, one on each chromosome, one from the mother and one from the father. When we think about cancer development in terms of what happens, this is a cartoon that gives you a sense of the model for how we think this develops. So here we're going to use breast cancer as an example. And the woman on the left is one who is the more typical non-hereditary case. And so what you can see with her on the left is that she has inherited two normal copies of a particular gene that would be important. And as an example, let's use the gene BRCA1. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more in the talk, but it's a gene that works to suppress cancers from forming. So she's inherited a normal copy of this gene from both her mother and her father. And maybe at some point in the course of her life, she has some event, cause unknown most of the time, that causes one of those copies to stop working in a susceptible cell, like a breast cell. Well, we think that's OK, because she continues to have a normal gene functioning from the other parent. But what if there's another bad luck or other sort of event where she loses the function of that copy? Well, then the cell would be unprotected and be able to go down the path to cancer. It's a simplification, but one that I think is helpful as we imagine this process. And it's a theory known as the two-hit hypothesis of cancer, which some of you may have heard of. <laughs> 
In the hereditary state, we're looking at something different. And so for the woman on the right, what the schema is saying is that she has inherited a damaged copy of one of these important tumor suppressor genes. Again, let's call it BRCA1 from one of her parents, either mother or father. And so she starts life with one of these genes non-functional in every cell in her body. And so the idea here is that she is only one step away in every cell from a situation where that gene would be missing and thus mutations would be able to accumulate unchecked. We think of it as though the cell has lost its law enforcement and basically mutations will continue to proliferate and go into a cancer. And so that could happen at any point, and it really would take only this one hit since she's born with one already. And so in that model, we would expect to see cancer at an earlier age and more often, maybe twice in one person. And indeed, that is what we see. So a common question, again, addressed by this simple cartoon here is, does an inherited mutation equal a certainty of cancer? And the answer is no. So when people inherit these mutations that cause a higher risk, again, what they inherit is a different probability than other people that a cancer will develop. We don't always know what the modifying influences are, and this slide just gives some sort of examples of things that might be happening. We think other genes may play a role in interacting with a mutated gene. Uh, response to DNA damage, how a person does that. Certainly carcinogens, things like cigarette smoke and others, would be uh, thought to interact in some of these cases, although not all the mechanisms are worked out. And then for a number of these gene mutations that I'll talk about today, we tend to see tumors that are associated with breast and gynecologic tracts. And so there is certainly a thought that hormonal and reproductive factors are playing a role in some way. But the key point is that what's inherited is risk and not a certainty of cancer. So moving on to give a little bit of a portrait of what we see in terms of cancer causes and deaths in the United States in 2015, this is an estimate from the American Cancer Society. And so looking at new cases, which are the two blocks on the left here, we can see that the most common cancer of men in the United States is prostate cancer and of women is breast cancer. When we look at cancer deaths, the most common cause of cancer death in the United States, unfortunately, is lung cancer for both genders. We can see that both breast and prostate cancer are lower on the list, which is a measure of the success that we've had there in terms of early detection and successful treatment. But certainly, lung cancer remains a giant problem. Focusing a bit more on breast cancer today, I just want to make the point that the average woman's lifetime risk of getting breast cancer is about 1 in 8 or 10 to 12 percent. So we know a lot of the breast cancer risk factors, and this is a graph that shows, the table rather, that shows the associated relative risk increase by various risk factors. Top at the list certainly is female sex and age greater than 50 years. That's the typical time when people tend to get breast cancer. But as we go down the list, we see that having a high-risk inherited genetic mutation like BRCA1 or BRCA2 is a very strong risk factor associated with a five-fold increase, as if you keep going down is a family history with a first-degree relative, and sometimes that means that there's a BRCA or other high-risk mutation in the family. As you go down on this table, you can see a number of other risk factors that we might think of as lifestyle or reproductive. So age at first live birth greater than 30 years, which unfortunately is considered old, too bad for some of us. Um, but then we see other things like menopausal hormone therapy, alcohol, obesity, some of those other factors. So I think the portrait that's given here is that the most common risk factors across the population for breast cancer are reproductive, hormonal, and lifestyle. But, but the highest magnitude risk factors we know of are genetic, and so it behooves us to think about both of them as we manage this disease. So this is a slide that gives a sense of the landscape of what we know about breast cancer. It's a few years old now, actually seven years old, but I still like it because it gives a sense of the schema of what's known about these genes. So just to orient you on the vertical axis, the y-axis is relative risk. And what that means is how much higher your risk is, how many times higher your risk is than average if you inherit one of these mutations. So with a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, your risk might be up to tenfold higher than the average risk. On the x-axis, the horizontal axis, we have minor allele frequency, which just means how common is the mutation in the population. And you can see that in the upper left-hand corner, BRCA1, BRCA2, and these other gene mutations are quite rare, maybe in one in 400 people, one in 
300 people in some cases, and even rarer than that. So a real interest in this field has been moving down the curve from the upper left toward the bottom right. There's been a lot of interest in understanding gene mutations that are more common than one in 400 and that would affect more of the population. And so in recent years, we've been able to move down this curve from the upper left-hand corner, BRCA1, BRCA2, and others, to these more moderate risk genes in the middle. And they have names like BRIP1, ATM, PALB2, and CHECK2. And over the last two years, we've just begun testing for these newly identified gene mutations in the clinic. It's been a pretty interesting time, and we're roughly doubling the number of families for whom we can get answers about the causes of their breast cancer risk. And so I'm showing you this graph for breast cancer, but there are some similar sort of concepts and findings in other common cancers like colon cancer as well. So very interesting times. And that's really related to the rapid progress that we've seen in genetic technology. So clinical genetic testing is advancing very rapidly due to new next generation sequencing techniques. And so what this graph shows is the exponential growth in data that are available per $1,000. Back uh, years ago, it used to be that we really could only do a single gene test, and it wasn't so many years ago. Honestly, uh, we were paying costs in the range of $4,000 for two gene tests as recently as 2013. But now we're seeing a really rapid rise toward whole genome sequencing everything for somewhere in the range of $1,000. So for the first time in years, it's not the technology that limits us. But I think the question is, how does all this progress actually translate into our ability to take care of patients? And so it's been a really interesting new world for cancer genetics in the last two years. There have been some remarkable events which have uh, caused that to happen. One of them was in 2013, the Supreme Court said that it was no longer permissible to patent a gene. And so one company that had had a patent on BRCA gene testing for 20 years no longer did. So a remarkable thing, and into that space we had many other companies flooding, re which really resulted in a decline in costs, which is good for patients, but also a change in the business model whereby companies would say, hey, we can give you 15 genes for less than what you used to pay for two. And so there was really a shift in the incentive toward testing more genes. And the other remarkable thing that happened around that time is what we call the Angelina Jolie effect, where because the celebrity revealed her BRCA1 mutation in the New York Times, all of us had gigantic growth in our clinic and wait lists of greater than six months. And so I think it's safe to say that more women are being tested for more genes than ever before. And so we at Stanford have been quite interested in looking at these new gene panels. And this is just uh, the abstract of a manuscript that we published last year, where we did a clinical evaluation of one of these new multiple gene panels. It's a lot of text here, but the summary is that we tested women who came into our clinic for BRCA testing and then offered an additional sample for research. And we found that for these patients who came in because of family and personal history, the chance of finding another mutation was about the same as of finding a BRCA mutation, about 10% for each. We did find a lot of uncertain variants, which is a hazard of testing. Sometimes you find things where you don't know what they mean. But this was something that was of great interest to patients. All the patients who were offered their research results wanted them. And in fact, we did begin to make some changes in screening recommendations that have detected one early cancer so far. So I think this move toward broader testing is going to benefit people. So I'm going to talk briefly about what we do once we find these genetic risk factors and, and know more about who is at higher risk. And so for breast, we really get into questions about screening and prevention. And so mammogram would be the standard way to screen, an x-ray view of the breast, uh, which many of us are familiar with. Um, and that starts yearly at age 40 in general. That's the recommendation, although there are some who recommend other schedules, as well as a clinical breast exam every one to three years starting at age 20 and self-breast exam monthly. That's for average risk women. But there's a lot of accumulating evidence that it's really not enough for high-risk women. And this slide shows another interesting factor, which is mammographic density. And what that is is an appearance on the mammogram of very white breast tissue. In the upper panel, you can see it go from gray on the left to much more white in the mammogram shown, the fourth one over, that's extremely dense. And since cancers show up white, it really can be hard to see when you have dense breast tissue. 
And so that's been a problem with mammogram alone, particularly in high-risk women who tend to get cancers younger when they may have more dense breast tissue. And so there have been some interesting new develops like using a special kind of mammogram called 3D that I've shown here at the bottom on the panel where we really can see cancers a little bit better. There's an example in that yellow uh, ring. I'm not sure if you can see it, but the 3D mammogram, which is more like a CAT scan of the breast, can pick up quite a bit more. The other tools that we can use are MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, and they're particularly good for young high-risk women with dense breast tissue. This is a real patient from Stanford who had a BRCA1 mutation, and her mammogram image on the left was quite dense, and it was called as negative. But her MRI, which you can see on the right, had a lesion in the middle, a white central lesion here that we're pointing out here with the arrow, that turned out to be cancer and would have been missed had we not escalated her screening based on her genetic mutation status. So MRI can be a very good tool for high-risk women. It's not very useful for average-risk women in whom it mostly finds false positives, and it just gives an example of how we need to target our techniques. So the other strategies that we would use would include surgical cancer prevention. And for breast cancer, this would include prophylactic mastectomy or removal of both breasts to prevent a cancer. It's exceptionally effective, 95% reduction in risk, but as you can imagine, even the most high-risk women might be reluctant to do this because it's quite invasive and irreversible. And so high-risk screening with MRI and mammogram is a more common alternative. For women with BRCA mutations, in addition to high risk of breast cancer, there's high risk of ovarian cancer. And so they are advised to remove ovaries and fallopian tubes, which greatly reduces their risk of ovarian cancer and can also reduce their risk of breast cancer by inducing early menopause. There are also agents for medical breast cancer prevention, drugs here like tamoxifen and raloxifene, selective estrogen response modulators, and I won't go into all the details, but just to say that tamoxifen, and lower down on the slide, exemestane, are drugs that are used to treat breast cancer, but are also good options for preventing breast cancer in high-risk women and tend to be underused. Finally, just a word on lifestyle choices. These are some uh, basically figures from various trials that looked at interventions like a low-fat diet up on the upper left um, and showed that there did seem to be some evidence of a reduction in risk, uh, at least uh, some trend that way in terms of women who took a low-fat diet. And we see that with increasing amounts of alcohol, there's an association with increased risk, with increasing amounts of exercise, decreased risk. So the effect sizes tend to be rather modest, but certainly these are things that people can do and I think important to emphasize as well. So just to finish up, some thoughts about where we are with research and things that our group and others have been doing. Our group has been really interested in understanding people's choices about strategies to reduce their risk of cancer. And one study we did recently was to look at women's choices about surgery when they had breast cancer. Did they choose just to do one-sided mastectomy or a lumpectomy where you just remove the tumor? Or did they choose to do double mastectomy to treat a one-sided breast cancer for prevention? And so, again, I won't go through all the details of this figure, but what it shows is that basically over time in the state of California from 1998 to 2010, there was a rise in all age groups of the use of double mastectomy, which is shown by the line with the dark squares, the one that you see rising up over time, and a drop in the use of one-sided mastectomy or lumpectomy, which were less aggressive procedures. So it's sort of interesting, we see a rise in the use of double mastectomy from 3% to 35% in women under the age of 40. And we actually don't see an associated survival benefit for most women. And so it's something that we're studying in terms of trying to understand how can we best target interventions like this to a person's risk so we don't have overuse or underuse of interventions. And one of the ways that we've been interested in doing that has been to use decision support tools. Our group has actually been interested in building computer tools that help to guide patients in their choices about management of their cancer risk. And this is actually an online tool that our group built that is available online for anyone who is a computer geek like me and likes to play with these things. It's uh, bracatool.stanford.edu and anybody can look at it. And basically this is one for patients with BRCA gene mutations where a woman can enter her gene mutation and her age and can choose among different options for managing her risk. So screening with mammogram and MRI, uh, surgeries at various ages, and can get estimates in terms of 
these bar charts of the likelihood of being alive without cancer at the age of 70 versus other outcomes. And so again, just as an overview, this is the kind of thing that we've been trying to do to help guide personalized cancer risk reduction and screening. So I'm going to stop there and provide contact information for our Stanford Cancer Genetics Group led by Jim Ford and co-led by myself and our many genetic counselors and our research manager. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one or two questions from the audience. Yes. Many. A great question. It was very interesting. Um, actually, the hour after the Supreme Court verdict uh, in 2013, I received at least five emails from different companies that said, hey, great, now we're offering BRCA at half the price. Um, so it has been a flood, and it's been very interesting. I think it's probably good for patients because the cost has gone way down. There are questions about quality control and how the information will be shared, but it's certainly a new world in terms of competition and lots of companies coming in. Mm. Right, so 23andMe looked at uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, markers associated with a slight increase in cancer risk. And I think, you know, again, that's a long story, but the challenge there was, was there, was there relevance in terms of taking care of patients for those results? So that's sort of been the question. Um, the kinds of uh, labs that do testing for things like BRCA are looking at higher risk mutations, so it's sort of a tricky space at this point.